this. Oh. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up, even from far away. You comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There is a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above me that I can't fathom it. You are the one who created my innermost parts. You knit me together while I was still in my mother's womb. I give thanks to you that I was marvelously, marvelously set apart. Your works are wonderful. I know that very well. My bones weren't hidden from you when I was being put together in a secret place. When I was being woven together in the deep parts of the earth, your eyes saw my embryo, and on your scroll every day was written that being formed for me before any one of them had yet happened. God, your plans are incomprehensible to me. Their total number is countless. If I tried to count them, they had number of grains of sand. If I came to the very end, I'd still be with you. May God bless the reading of his word. For grace, mercy, and peace belong to you. They are free gifts from the one who was and is and is to come. Sometimes when I struggle with what to say, as I have this week, I hate it, seriously hate it, when another mind just nails in a few words the thoughts I've been trying to untangle. Sort of like when you've drubbed a shot and your partner hits a hole in one, or somebody's brownies are just better than yours. Oh, how I wish I'd said that is absolutely the worst feeling in the world for someone like me. That was the case a few days ago when I was deeply engaged in reflection on this psalm, Psalm 139, our focus for today. Psalm 139 is, I think, one of the most revealing passages in all the Bible not to mention one of the most intensely personal. And Richard Rohr, a Franciscan friar, and one of the more prolific God thinkers of our age, posted this observation on Facebook. Not about 139, but it might as well have been. It's on the screen for you to look at as I read. We cannot attain the presence of God because we're already totally in the presence of God. What is absent is awareness. There it was, as you can see for yourself. Everything I was struggling to say in about 20 words about the meaning of this hymn to God's relationship to mankind. So somewhat in frustration, I posted, sarcastically I think, that I was giving up and mailing in a one-sentence sermon and I had intended to sleep in today because there was nothing left to be said. Which prompted at least one gleeful retort <laughs> that amounted to, yippee! <laughs> you should be so lucky, right? I thought about entitling these thoughts today, Me and God, or perhaps more correctly, God and I, for the English teachers out there, because the whole poem of Psalm 139 is loaded with personal pronouns, I and me and you, more than 40 references in all as the writer speaks in these sweeping terms of the inescapable nature of God, the God who is all-knowing and anywhere and everywhere, all at once. The epitome of you can run, but you can't hide. 
You have searched me and known me, the psalmist says. You discern my thoughts from far away. You are acquainted with all of my ways. Where can I go from your spirit? Clearly, it sounds like the creator of the universe has this psalmist number. But as powerful as this imagery is, I ended up instead with the title that you see in the bulletin, Stitched in Time, because I was pulled more deeply into verses 13 and 14, which read in part, For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fiercely and wonderfully made. Now, the Pew Bible translation may not use the word fearfully, but most translations do. And fearfully, in this sense, does not mean being scared, the way we would use the word fear. The equivalent Hebrew word is related more to a feeling of awe and wonderment, as if God were marveling in God's own miracle of human creation. Imagine that. God stepping back saying, look what I did. Whoa. Images of, of weaving and sewing and knitting and all things, cloth and needles, occur frequently in stories in the Bible. And they serve largely as metaphors for how our creator God, the one who is creating still, weaves together not only the strands of the tapestry of our lives, but also the fabric of larger communities of faith, such as this one, not to mention the universe. That pop music phrase, I was trying to think of it this morning, I was walking over here, Dreamweaver. Remember that song? Somehow that's kind of how I see God. A few weeks ago, when we baptized little Miss Lily, I said that God only made one, Lily Brown, and that God will never make another again. For she, like you and me in turn, is unique for all time. When a human soul is created by the knitting and weaving and nurturing hands of God, shaped in the womb of eternity, if you will, stitched together as it were, the creator and the created are no longer separate but they are one. Much like this quilt up here. This quilt that adorns the communion table this morning is something I suspect a lot of you recognize because your hands are on it and in it. Each piece unique in its own way, hand-woven individually to commemorate our 50th anniversary as a congregation, however long ago that was. Science tells us that the whole, the whole is the sum of its parts. But the equally important corollary is that without each of the parts, there is no whole. Which is probably my obtuse way of saying God's world isn't complete without you and without me. Let that thought sink in for just a moment. The world can't really do without you. Yet the sad irony of our spiritual existence is that as our lives unfold in real time, it can be like viewing the backside of a tapestry like this. Or as I'm sure Nancy could tell you, there can appear to be nothing more than this tangled jumble of thread, frayed pieces, occasionally knotted, and all in some kind of random pattern. It's no wonder. It's no wonder that people lose heart on their faith journey, give up and abandon commitments, whether to God or to church or whatever, because what they see and experience in their search for God doesn't seem to make any sense. But things really aren't always as they seem. 
And that is where Richard Rohr's observation is so pointedly true. We simply lack awareness of the presence of the God who is already there. It's only when you turn that tapestry over that you see the artistry of the creation, the rich colors, the texture, the patterns that make up, in this case, the beauty of God's handiwork, the handiwork which is your life and mine. The importance of Psalm 139 is that it addresses the only question worth asking in life. The only question. Who is God? And perhaps the corollary, where is God to be found? How about you? Have you ever seriously and honestly faced up to that question? If I were to go around the sanctuary right now, one by one, could you answer that question? Could you? How would you respond? Let's start over here. I, I, I'm not going to do that. But what I'm trying to do is shake you into a greater awareness of who and whose you are, and to challenge you when I say that you are shortchanging yourself. You're shortchanging yourself as a child of God if you don't try to turn the tapestry of your life over, stop looking at the knotted up little moments and happenings, and instead look at the larger mosaic that God has made and is continuing to make in the life story that has your name on it. I think the reason we struggle so mightily with the notion that God's somehow up to something, and I hope it doesn't hurt, that God's somehow up to something, is that we're afraid deep down to allow ourselves to be vulnerable and to abandon our devotion to our self-imposed literal mindedness, that thing that we insist makes us so unique our brain power, which dictates that there's only one way to look at life, namely that two plus two always must equal four, and that all ideas must be either or, and never ever both and. So the notion of holding opposite thoughts in tension with one another, as the Bible so often asks us to do, appears to be simply out of the question. In other words, when it comes to God, the sovereign of the universe, who is all-powerful and all-knowing, the ruler over everything, and totally unapproachable, that God, that great rule maker and judge, cannot possibly be simultaneously Emmanuel, or God with us, the God whose very definition, definition is love, and the one who knows us so intimately inside and out. How can God be up there and also in here? That's just not possible. And yet that is precisely what the writer of Psalm 139 is trying to tell us when he describes not only a God who is omnipresent, but one who is constantly searching us out. Where, where are they? Because that self-same God who shaped us personally and individually from the dust of the earth, the divine womb, as it were, to be a one-of-a-kind expression of divine intention, that God is like... Maybe you and I going on Ancestry.com trying to find out our family roots and what we're made of. God wants to know his divine family history too. What really, what really matters about God to the author of Psalm 139 is that the divine you he keeps talking about and addresses so passionately. 
That's God Almighty himself has an intimate connection, an intimate connection with you and me. God's not wholly other, as some theologians have, have postulated. God is wholly with, the psalmist is saying. That intimacy, which led the creator of the universe to reduce God's self to the size of a human embryo in order to be one of us. That reality is why Father Rohr's insight and that of the psalmist is so profoundly hopeful because it suggests that if we but open our eyes and ears, the eyes and ears of our imagination, and not allow ourselves to be imprisoned by the language of our mind, we will quickly become aware of the divine presence that surrounds us all. Close with this illustration the other afternoon. I dipped into a Netflix movie Cammy was watching. And in this one scene, which was an art studio, a young man and a young woman were at separate easels. She was doing quite well with her creation, but the boy was struggling with his. And so he asked the girl, how do you paint so effortlessly? She said, it's easy. I just close my eyes and imagine things that aren't there. And then I open my eyes and make them real. You should try it. So should you. Open your eyes, that is, and see the God who is already there, hiding in plain sight, waiting to be discovered, waiting for you to be aware of that divine presence. May that heightened awareness enlighten all your days, dear ones. Shalom and Amen.